Hello, and welcome back to the Mother of the Year podcast. First of all, I want to take a moment and thank everyone so much who tuned in to episode one. You know, I took a chance on this and didn't know if it was just going to be my closest friends and family listening, but I do think there really is a community of women out there who need somebody to relate to. I remember, as I mentioned in the first podcast, how shocking it was when I had my first child. And honestly, I felt pretty alone in a lot of my feelings. I didn't want to admit some of the feelings that I was having because I felt really guilty. I felt like, oh man, something's wrong with me. Why doesn't anybody else feel like this? And I really didn't want to admit how I was feeling. We're actually going to come back to that guilt. Uh, The title of this podcast is Guilt, a Mom's Best Friend. Because one of the things I've realized as a mom is how much of my energy is spent on guilt. So before we delve into that topic, I want to give a little update. First of all, I realized when I listened back to that first podcast, you know, I wanted to reflect on things that I liked and things I wanted to change. I never actually introduced myself by name. It's kind of an amateur move on my part, but hey, I'm learning. So my name is Andrea Pyle, and as I mentioned several times, I'm a mother of two small children. I live in Southern California, and I'm a full-time teacher as well as obviously being, well, shoot, I guess I can't call myself a full-time mom because my kids are in daycare. Oh my gosh, I feel so guilty already thinking about the fact that I'm not a full-time mom. I guess I'm a full-time mom on the weekends, and it's enough to make me crazy, but we'll get back to that. So my son is now six months. I mentioned on the last podcast that sleep was my major and pretty much only complaint with my little angel. Um, He is technically sleeping through the night. Technically. He doesn't do those several wake-ups through the night, so I guess I should be considering myself lucky. But he pretty much steadily wakes up at 4.30 in the morning. 4.30 30 in the morning. That's just insane. That's just insane. When I went to his six month checkup, the nurse practitioner asked, So, you know, how's he sleeping at night? I said, Well, he's actually sleeping through the night, but he pretty much wakes up at 4 30 every morning. And she was like, Wow, that's a great stretch. And I wanted to be like, Yeah, that still means I'm waking up at 4 30 in the morning. So um, I'm trying to just accept it. I mean, the second that I go in there to get him and he just smiles at me with this unconditional love, I just, you know, it makes it okay. So I can handle that. Honestly, the most traumatic thing that's happened in the last month was daylight savings. If I had to hear one more person talk about the fact, oh my gosh, this weekend we get an extra hour of sleep, I think I was going to punch them in the face. Daylight savings is a mother of an infant's worst nightmare. The morning of daylight savings, that means that instead of getting up at 4.30, my son was up at 3.30. And I just kind of laid there in my bed. Awake, of course, because the second I hear him, I'm awake. I just laid there and was just like, is this my life? Is this my life? And the response that I got from people when I complained, because, of course, you know, had to complain about it, people are like, well, technically it was 4.30, not 3.30. Really? Really? Is that the response you're going to give me? Because, yes, you're right. Technically speaking, I guess it was 4.30, But waking up at 3.30 just kind of threw off the whole day. And it also meant that my daughter was up at 5 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock. So that stretch to nap time was super duper fun. But that's the nice thing about daycare. The next day it wasn't my problem. It became someone else's problem. Is that totally awful of me to say? There's that mom guilt creeping in. So, you know, I've realized now that my son is getting that long stretch of sleep, as the nurse practitioner told me, there really isn't enough sleep. Whether I was getting four hours, six hours, honestly, I do tend to get eight hours from time to time because I fall asleep at eight o'clock at night, 
it really just isn't enough sleep. So if I can just convince myself that it's going to suck waking up no matter what, I think I can be okay. I just need to have that coffee going. And, uh, you know, people always joke about, well, just have another cup of coffee. If I have more than a cup and a half of coffee, I have the jitters like you wouldn't believe. You know, I look like I'm Jones in for something. I can't drink too much caffeine. It makes me nuts. So I just have to kind of get through the day. All right, so let's start diving into this topic of guilt. Guilt is such an awful emotion. I mean, I guess there are some positive things that can come out of guilt. I'm someone who's always had a guilty conscience, and I feel like for my whole life that's kind of kept me out of trouble because I didn't want to disappoint my parents or get in trouble or, you know, disappoint my boss or anything like that. So, I mean, there is some good stuff that can come out of guilt. Um, you know, you can have wife guilt, uh, especially now that I have kids, I, I feel like I'm not paying enough attention to my husband or making sure that we have that quality time. I have friend guilt where I feel like I see the missed calls and I, I see the voicemails, but I don't even feel like I have time to sit and listen to the voicemails because the second that I do, my children want to grab at my phone and play games or look at pictures. I have daughter guilt because I feel like I don't want to ask for help babysitting too much because both my parents are retired and they both worked so hard my whole life. And so the last thing I want to do is feel like, oh, great, you're retired. You can babysit whenever I want. So I feel like I have to kind of tiptoe around babysitting, even though, side note, my parents really are amazing and they're probably listening to this. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. And they do babysit my children a ton. So then there's also employee guilt where I feel like maybe there's more I could be doing at work and I want to make sure that I'm being good at the job that I do. And then, of course, there's just good old human being guilt, whether it's the environment that I should be recycling more when I'm just so exhausted at the end of the day, I just start throwing everything in the trash or random stuff in the recycling bin. And then, you know, I shouldn't be texting and driving. I did get a cell phone ticket. It totally sucked. That was uh, three years ago. Uh, Side story, since, you know, I love to go off on these little tangents. Um, When I was pregnant with my daughter, I had a blood clot that was right behind where the placenta attached. And so I had a lot of bleeding. And I was actually at a risk of having a miscarriage And I was on my way to a follow-up appointment at the doctor's on the phone with my best friend, crying, talking about it, and that's when I got a cell phone ticket. And so the police officer pulled me over, and this guy, he had to be so sarcastic, and he was like, I guess it really isn't sarcasm, it's kind of he was being literal, but he was like, do you even know how long I was driving next to you? I was driving next to you for like five minutes, and you didn't even know. And I was like, hmm... Let me show you this piece of paper that says threatened miscarriage. This is where I'm headed. Just give me my ticket and let me go about my way. So anywho, shouldn't text and drive, especially with kids in the car. But I'm not going to sit here and lie and say it never happens. So what I try to do is if there's a call or a text and I feel like I can't whip out a quick text message, I do need to just call back. But you know what? Maybe I should make that my New Year's resolution to never do that because that's really awful. God forbid something should ever happen. I would never forgive myself. There's that guilt. There's that guilt. It just constantly haunts me. So I could do an entire podcast about all of these kinds of guilt that are floating around in my head all day, every day. But This podcast is about the perfectly imperfect mom. So let's stick to mom guilt, okay? A mother's best friend. O-M-G. I don't even know where to start. There are so many things to feel guilty about when you're a mom. It's just a never-ending list. So uh, let me tell you where this topic kind of came from. The milestone that we're at right now with my son is starting to give him baby food. I remember with my daughter spending hours steaming vegetables, pureeing them, 
boiling apples, pureeing them, freezing them in the little ice cube trays to make perfect little one ounce size portions of homemade baby food, making sure the vegetables are organic, making sure the fruit is organic. Uh, I just can't. I just can't. I just can't. About a month ago when I realized, oh, wow, it's probably start time to thinking about food, I realized, oh, my gosh, when am I going to have time to do this? I have the weekends. That's the only time that I pretty much have at home. I don't know when this is going to happen. And now not only do I have my two-and-a-half-year-old to think about, you know, she's kind of easy. I can put on a show, and she's pretty much good, and she loves to play independently so she can play with her toys. But then I have to consider the fact that I still have an infant who is totally obsessed with me, which I love. But he wants to be held a lot of the time, and he sits on my hip real well like he loves it, but then I'm stuck with only one hand. So how am I going to boil things? How am I going to drain things? How am I going to puree things? And you know what? I, I am fascinated with the women who get stuff done during nap time, but if I am lucky enough to have both children napping at the same time, a lot of times I just want to flop on my bed and stare at my phone and relax and maybe sometimes catch like half of an episode of something. Or if I'm lucky, a whole episode of something saved on my DVR. As you know, I love TV. So the last thing I want to do in that teeny tiny window that could be anywhere from 15 minutes to three hours, the last thing I want to do is stress out about getting something done. So I decided recently that I was not going to home make my son's food. Totally felt guilty about that. Um, I told my husband, I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to buy the food this time. And he kind of had this moment and he's like, but remember I helped you make it? We spent, you know, we did that together. And I wanted to be like, yeah, I do remember that. But that was also before you started working seven days a week. My husband is an amazing carpenter. He can literally build me my dream home. He Next project we're going to do is we only have one bathroom, so he's going to build us a second bathroom. Isn't that amazing? Can you hear the tone in my voice? It really is a blessing and a curse. I love that my husband can build me a bathroom, but I also am just exhausted and the last thing I want to think about is living in a construction zone. So there's that. Um, so anywho, so I just told him, no, I'm just going to buy it. And you know what? I'll, I'll just buy organic. Did I buy organic baby food? No. I was at the store and the store that I was at, they didn't have organic baby food. So I had a decision to make. Do I want to stress out about getting organic baby food or do I just want to get baby food? And this is where that guilt comes in. I feel like, okay, but if I don't get organic baby food, is he going to have cancer someday? Am I going to cause him to have childhood obesity? And you know what? I just bought the baby food. And that was it. I know at his daycare, they give him baby food, and it's not organic. If I wanted him to eat organic baby food, I would bring the baby food, and they would give him the baby food that I'd bring. But I just can't. Is that being lazy? Maybe. I don't know, but I'm really so busy doing everything that I can't think of myself as lazy. I just can't. So I'm not giving him organic baby food. And I feel guilty about that. I feel guilty that I made baby food for my daughter and now my son gets non-organic store-bought baby food. But you know what? He's happy. He's healthy. He's thriving. So I'm just trying to give myself a break on it. And that's the same thing for my daughter's milk. When we started giving my daughter milk, I remember thinking, okay, they said on the news that, you know, daughters are starting to get breasts at a younger age because the milk that they're drinking is full of hormones. So I'm going to make sure that she only drinks organic milk. And I would even buy milk and bring it to her daycare. So that lasted for about six months. Now, mind you, at home, we only have organic milk. So when she's at home, she has organic milk only. But as far as daycare goes, I just let it go. I mean, I couldn't remember to bring it over there. I have to remember to bring everything else. And so at school, I don't think they have organic milk. And you know what? I'm okay with that. 
So thinking about milk, the other kind of mom guilt that us moms get to deal with is breast versus bottle. If you are a mom listening to this podcast, you can think back, or maybe you're still in the middle, of when you had to feed your baby, your little infant sweetheart. So we are now socialized. There's even the slogan, breast is best. So I knew I wanted to breastfeed my babies. So my daughter was born. She latched. Actually, it went pretty well. When she was three months old, I went back to work for about three weeks to finish the school year. It kind of worked out nice that way. And I was totally shocked because I pumped. I did everything you're supposed to do. I brought the pump. I'd lock my classroom door. I'd put a little sign out there that said, privacy, please. And I swear at the three-week mark, my milk went away. Like, one day I was overflowing at the pump, and the next day I had nothing. So then when my son was born, um, it was the same thing. I had so much milk, and when I went back to work, I swear it was that same three-week mark, I would pump and get maybe a combined ounce of breast milk. And for those ladies out there who've pumped, it is such an amazing experience. Not at all. It's miserable. And you feel like someone is pulling on your nipple and it's not pleasant and it's just in the way. And even I even had like the hands-free bra thing. So technically my hands were free, but what are you going to do with your hands besides look at your phone? So... Both my children ended up having to be um, on formula, which it's so shameful feeling. There's that mom guilt. When you go to the store and you buy formula, you feel like people are like, "Mm, breast is best. And you're like, well, I would if I could. So it's just tough, you know. And uh, the other fun experience that I had when I was breastfeeding my son was I actually got guilted by the doctor for overfeeding my son. When we went to his two-week checkup, I think, um, my son had gained, I think, two pounds, which normally they're back at their birth weight, I think, at that point, but he was back at his birth weight before we even left the hospital. So he is kind of a champ that way. But my mom and I were, like, smiling and laughing, like, oh, he's such a big boy. And the doctor was like, well, actually, there's such a thing as getting too big too fast. And I looked at him like, what? What did I do wrong? I'm, I'm just feeding my baby. And I knew that I like to breastfeed on demand. And so now I was panicking that I'm overfeeding my son and I'm going to give him all these health issues and he's going to be obese. And so now what? And so the doctor told me, well, I want you to strictly feed him. I think it was every two and a half to three hours. So at first it was kind of upsetting because then you actually have to listen to the baby cry because when you breastfeed on demand, the baby cries and you feed it. But now I had to tell whoever was listening that, well, I can't feed him because he's on a strict schedule because he was gaining weight too fast. And believe it or not, it actually was kind of liberating because when you're a mom who breastfeeds on demand, anytime the baby makes a peep, like whines even for a second, everybody looks at the mom and they're like, oh, he's hungry. And you'll be like, no, I literally just fed him. Yeah, but he's hungry. He's crying. And it's so exhausting because you feel like you're the only one who can fix the problem. So after the doctor said that, I got to be like, well, we have to figure it out because I can't feed him again. And so it was kind of a blessing in disguise. So now let's talk about mom guilt when it comes to daycare. As you know, I am a working mom, and as I mentioned in my last podcast, I really like working, so I don't feel guilty, per se, about working, but let's just say that I love daycare maybe more than the average mom. One of the things that I felt lucky enough to have was um, we decided to keep my daughter in daycare over the summer while I had my son. Now, I'm a teacher and so I have summers off and so one would assume 
that since I'm home from work for the summer, that I would be like, okay, now's my time to be with my kids for the whole summer. Well, I had my son in April, and so the school year got out at the very beginning of June. So he was like, gosh, just a little over a month old, and my daughter is very high maintenance. When we're all together, it's it's her show. She's the boss. I hate to admit that, but it's true. So I knew with my daughter around that my son really wasn't going to get that one-on-one newborn time that he needed and that I wanted. And so my husband and I discussed it and we decided, you know what, we will keep her in daycare because it would also keep her routine the same. And with the new baby, her whole life changed. And so I think having that stay the same would be beneficial for her. So I had a lot of guilt about that. Every day I would take her across the street to daycare and I would go home and spend time with her brother. And so I felt really guilty about that. I would actually hide my car. I would park my car around the street because, as I mentioned before, her preschool is like our front door faces their front door. So she knows my car. And so if she would see it, sometimes they would mention that she would say, oh, there's mama's car and where's mama? And so I would park my car around the street, and if I had to leave the house, I had to be, like, incognito trying to hide so she wouldn't see me because I felt guilty if she knew that mommy's at home with brother. And uh, So, anyhow, so I was home this summer, and it actually worked out really nice, but there were quite a few times that I was judged for this decision. Um, We had our both of our children's rooms redone this summer by my husband. They look beautiful, but that was a whole nother podcast. So uh, it was time for them to be painted. And so we brought a painter that my husband works with. And so he came and he's like, oh, where's your daughter? And I was like, oh, she's at school. And he was like, but you're here. Don't you miss her? Uh, uh, Bullet to the chest judgment, guilt, so many feelings with that statement. It's like, yes, I do miss her, but she likes school. And that's what I find myself telling people is honestly, my daughter's happier at school. They get to do crafts and they get to play outside and there's a bunch of toys that she doesn't have at home. And so what I try to say in those moments is that, well, she really likes school, but It's like I feel like a dog with my tail between my legs because my daughter should be home with me, I guess. And so that makes me feel really guilty. And now we're coming up. I'm about to have a week vacation off of work. And uh, I still have to pay for daycare for the week, whether I keep them home for me with me or not. So if I have to pay for it, why not? keep them in for a few days and actually have a little bit of a break to myself. So I totally feel guilty about that, but I am actually going to take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for myself. Um, It's kind of funny because their school is closed Thursday, Friday, so technically I can't have them in Thursday, Friday, but uh, they will be home with me Thursday, Friday, and Honestly, I just feel like I can be a better mom if I can get those tiny little breaks to myself. You know, I don't get a break. Like I mentioned, the only time I get to myself is the drive to and from work. So I think it's really important that I recognize that and I do take those small breaks for myself. But again, I do feel guilty about it. Um, I recently saw someone who is a stay-at-home mom. She actually even homeschools her children And when I saw her, we were kind of, she's known me since I was, you know, a young teenager and kind of grew up with each other's families. And so we were just kind of catching up and she was like, you know, so what time do you get home from work? And I feel lucky because I I have a teacher's hour, so I get out at three o'clock every day. And so I feel lucky about that. Now, unfortunately, I live a good 45 minute to an hour drive from my work And so I don't pick up my kids until 4.15 every day. And so I told her that. She looked at me with such sadness in her eyes, and she was like, then you really only get to see them for like two or three hours a day. That must be really hard. Bullet to the chest. (laughs) 
I was just like, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard. Like I felt like I had to like put on this act of like, it's, it is really hard. And you know, I just, I feel so sad all the time, but the truth is like, I pick up my kids at 4.15 and then the struggle is real until bedtime. Like my son's usually cranky because he barely slept at daycare. My daughter has to whine because my son's whining. Like they have to compete with each other that way. And so even though I see them for that two or three hours, it's not like I get to, we get to hold hands and skip through the daisies together. Like it's usually a grind until bedtime. So you know, I just had that same guilty feeling of like, oh yeah, I only get to see them for those two hours. Like, oh, I'm so sad about that. But a lot of times it's like, okay, now I'm gearing up for this good chunk of time to end my day where it's just, it's seriously a grind. So that's tough. So now I want to talk about the guilt of having two children. Part of the reason that I wanted to have a second child was because my daughter is a total people person. She's very social. She's very friendly. Um, Of course, she has to be in a good mood. If she's in a bad mood, that's a totally different story. But I knew my daughter would want to have a sibling, just have somebody to play with. When I became pregnant, we slowly introduced her to the idea of having a brother or a sister And then, of course, when we found out it was a boy, we started talking to her about her brother and trying to get her all excited. And then it was really fun because one of her favorite shows had an episode about the main character having a baby sister. So then we would sing the songs and try to get her excited that way. And then, obviously, it was time to have the baby. I was so excited to get those cute hospital pictures that people post where it's like little Susie meets little Johnny for the first time. And there's this beautiful picture of the siblings in the hospital bed with the mom. Well, when my daughter came to the hospital, she was more interested in the machines and just the hospital room in general. And so I think we got a picture where she's looking at her baby brother, but she really could have cared less. So that was fun. So then, you know, it was time to bring the baby home. And I'll never forget our first night home from the hospital. I was really happy because, as I mentioned previously, I was able to achieve a VBAC. So I was able to go home from the hospital the next day. When I had had a C-section with my daughter, I was in the hospital for five days. So I knew this time I wanted to come home because I didn't want to be away from my daughter for that long. So I was really happy to come home right away. And so that night we had my mom there. We had my brother and sister-in-law there with their two young girls. And it was a really good night. I had some champagne, which obviously I hadn't drank in a long time. So it was a good night. And... Eventually, my brother and sister-in-law left, and they left with their two girls, and all of a sudden, my daughter started throwing up, and she's not really a sick kid, so for her to throw up was very random, very out of the blue, and so I thought, okay, well, maybe that was like a fluke thing. No, she continued to throw up for about three hours straight. Um, If we moved her at all... She was so nauseous that she would just start throwing up. It was awful. I had a one-day-old baby in my arms, and everybody was panicking because there was projectile vomit everywhere. It broke my heart because, you know, my daughter, like I said, she's not sick very often. So for me to see her so sick and to know that I... I couldn't get sick. I couldn't get the baby sick. So I had to stay away. It was the worst night. It really was awful. Um, Eventually, the only thing that got her calm and not throwing up was she sat in this recliner that we have and she leaned. She was like her back was leaning against uh, my husband, her daddy, and as long as we kept her completely still, she could stop dry heaving. And so I think we just had her lay still for about an hour. And then eventually we just, 
I don't know. I don't know if we did it fast or if we did it slow, but we got her in her bed and just kind of stood there for a while until she fell asleep. And then the next day she was fine. So I don't know if that was like a physical reaction to having this new little being in our home, but it was literally our first night home with two kids. It was so scary. Uh, we have uh, my husband's cousin, so kind of like my cousin-in-law is a nurse at um, a hospital, and we were texting him, like, do we take her to the children's hospital? What do we do? It was so scary because she wouldn't stop throwing up, and she was completely lethargic. Like, she looked like a ghost, and he basically said, like, as long as she's not getting totally dehydrated, there's really nothing that they can do, so... We just kind of got through the night, and the next day, I guess it was some kind of horrible 24-hour bug, the next day, my husband got it. He does not throw up, kind of same as her. I mean, I've known the guy almost 10 years and can only think of two times that he's gotten sick, including this time, and um, he had it. He was throwing up. It was horrible. I slept one night on the couch with my couple-day-old baby. Um, And the reason he slept in the bed and I slept on the couch is that he had already been sleeping in the bed. So the bed was obviously already infected. We kind of made that like a little isolation room for him to heal in. So uh, that was pretty awful. So then he was sick. So then I have a newborn baby and I'm up all hours of the night. Um, If I did not have my mom there, I don't think I could have survived that first weekend. But I'm kind of off on a tangent because this is supposed to be about the guilt about having the two kids. So here's what made me guilty. You know, everyone, of course, wanted to know, how's your daughter dealing with the new baby? How's she handling it? And her reaction to the baby was... I couldn't have predicted it. It was not anything I expected at all. She was not angry about the baby. She was not jealous, I guess you would say, about the baby. She became totally depressed. It was the most heartbreaking thing to see. Honestly, you know, when you have a baby, your hormones are all over the place. I would just look at her for that first week, I would say, is the hardest. I would look at her... I would even just think about her and I would start crying. Um, She, if you know my daughter, she has this little sparkle about her. She has this fire to her. She's so funny. She's so friendly. And, you know, people just fall in love with her when they meet her. And that little sparkle went away for a little while. Um... She didn't smile a whole lot. She didn't really even want to play. She just kind of laid around, and she was she was definitely cuddly. She mostly cuddled with my mom, her nana, and uh, we just kind of had to get through it. I think she thought, like, oh, this baby's cute. What a cute idea. And then she realized this baby wasn't going anywhere, and the baby was in my arms a lot, and I was kind of like her girl, and so that was hard for her. Um it it just, oh man, it was heart-wrenching. And you kind of wonder, like, is it always going to be like this? Is it going to be like this forever? And I'll never forget um, the week that my son was born, Wally, the Disney movie, had been on TV. And we recorded it for her. And she gets very obsessed with things, different movies or different shows, and we'll watch them like a hundred times in a row. I remember actually Googling the first movie she became obsessed with was Finding Nemo. And I ended up Googling like child obsessed with movie because I started wondering if something was wrong with her. That's how many times we watched Finding Nemo, but no, it's normal. So anyways, um, the reason I mentioned Wally is because now if we watch it, I get this same pit in my stomach. When I hear certain songs that play in the movie, I almost get like this butterfly feeling in my stomach because I just remember being on the couch with the baby and my husband being there and my mom being there with my daughter and just it's like this weird pit in my stomach. I don't know what it is, but it was such a hard time to get through. Um, You know, it's, it's totally different now. 
you know, he's six months old, she's two and a half, but I see such a strong friendship already developing between the two of them. It is so magical. Like the way he looks at her, she has her own smile from him. You know, he kind of looks at my husband one way, he kind of looks at me one way, and then he looks at his sister a certain way that it honestly just melts my heart. He thinks she's hysterical. It already kind of works against me because she'll be doing something naughty, something she knows she's not supposed to do, and he'll just totally crack up at it. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, don't encourage her. But of course, deep down inside, I love it. I love the relationship that they have. And so that's something to be positive about. I know I like to joke about negative stuff a lot, but they do have an amazing relationship. But of course, they're both still young. I'm sure they'll be fighting like crazy eventually. Um, But it is definitely... I get very guilty about dividing my time between them. If I have help, like if my husband's there or if my mom's there or if, you know, a family member is there and and someone can help me with the two of them, it's, it's easy to divide my time. I spend time with her while someone else spends time with him or vice versa. But a lot of times it's me with the two kids. As I mentioned, my husband's a carpenter, so he has a job during the week, and then on the weekends, he does side work. So he'll pick up, you know, doing a bathroom here or a kitchen there. And so, you know, with his job, sometimes it can be feast or famine, so we try to take the work when when it's available. So I try not to resent that. We can save that for another podcast. (laughs) But, um... You know, so sometimes it is just me with the two kids, and then it really is a balancing act trying not to spend more time with one or the other, but I feel like the pendulum just swings one way or another versus one weekend to the next. Like one weekend, it might be my son getting all the attention. On another weekend, it might be my daughter getting all the attention. And so it's it's tough, you know. I feel guilty when I'm spending more time with one or the other, or I feel guilty if I'm holding my son because he's fussy and my daughter's begging for me to do a puzzle with her on the floor. And it's tough, you know. Sometimes there are those magical moments where the three of us are getting along together just fine, but a lot of times it really is a balancing act, and it's tough. So what I'm trying to do is say, you know, it's sister's turn right now or tell her it's brother's turn right now. And, you know, sometimes it works, but sometimes I'm saying it to a six-month-old and so he just doesn't understand. So it's tough. It's definitely a lot of guilt there. Um, another thing that I have to deal with the guilt about is my choices as a parent of sleep training. Um, different parents do different things. You know, when I tell people how tired I am, of course I get lots of advice for people and, you know, I hear different things from different people. Some people like to say, oh, you know, he's fine. Just let him cry. And then other people say like, well, when my children were babies, I just, I accepted the fact I was going to be tired and I just, I went to them as much as they needed me to. Well, I can't do that. I just can't be that kind of a parent. Um, I have done the cry it out method, which means, you know, at a certain age and when the child is at a certain place developmentally and at a certain stage where they're eating a certain amount and blah, 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 you do let them cry. Um, I think eventually maybe I can do a podcast about the cry it out method because honestly, for me, for my daughter, it was magical. It completely changed our lives. My son is still, like I said, not a totally amazing sleeper, so the jury's still kind of out on whether sleep training worked for him, but I do let him cry, and that's where the guilt comes from. Even this morning, you know, like I said, of course, he was up at 4.30. Actually, today it was 4.40. Isn't that amazing? 10 extra minutes. I woke up to the sound of silence at 4.40. I looked at my phone to see what time it was. I was like, wow. It's 4.40. I don't have to get up till 5. I'm going to go ahead and close my, oh, no, there's my son. He's awake. So that's when I I did look at my phone for a few minutes just to kind of wake up and not feel like I want to kill someone. And then I got in the shower. I think I got out of the shower at about 5.15. And 
Lately, he hasn't been crying when he wakes up. He just kind of talks, but then there's that fear that he's going to wake his sister up. So I do try to get to him as fast as possible. But occasionally, once in a blue moon, he still does wake up in the middle of the night. And, um, you know, my husband and I have made the decision to let the child cry. But I will say those middle of the night cry sessions are what can lead to marital fights don't want to get into that too much, but it does become a battle of what do we do? Do we get up? Do we get him? Do we let him cry? And it's, it's the only thing that stops me is the guilt, the guilt of what if he's hungry, the guilt of what if he has a dirty diaper, the guilt of what if he's teething. And you definitely don't want to jump to the conclusion of always just giving Tylenol, But I will admit, we are definitely believers in giving a little Tylenol if there is a teething issue. But of course, you can't ask like, hey, dude, are you getting teeth? He can't answer that. So you kind of, it's a guessing game. So you just kind of go with your instincts on that. So it's tough. Letting him cry is tough. But like I mentioned before, even this morning, he was up at 440. So he was, he was up rubbing his eyes, you know, it was like, do I get him? Do I see if he goes back to sleep? But I don't want him to wake up his sister, so I get him. Then when I see him rubbing his eyes, I have that guilt of, oh, should I have let him stay in his bed? Would he have gone back to sleep? But at least I know if I have him and I take him out to the living room, then maybe his sister can sleep a little bit longer because, you know, she's at the age where if she's tired, she'll just straight up be mean. So, uh, this morning, you know, about an hour later, maybe an hour and a half, like he's rubbing his eyes like crazy and acting tired. So I know he's tired. It's so tough because if only you could rationalize with a baby, like even yesterday, I'm not exaggerating at daycare. He slept for a combined total of one hour, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon. I don't know how they deal with it. I asked him, like, was he fussy? And they're like, no, he was totally happy the whole time. But it's crazy because, you know, I don't want to put him to bed before 7 p.m. That's nuts. But when he hasn't slept all day, like, he physically cannot stay awake past, like, 6.15. And so then when people ask, when I tell them he wakes up so early, they say, well, what time does he go to bed? And then I tell him he goes to bed early, and they're like, well, then maybe that's the problem because everybody's an expert. Anyway... Let's stay on track. So then this morning, I finally decided, you know what? I'm just going to put him in bed. I know he's tired. He cried so hard that, you know, the guilt, it becomes like a physical pain in my chest. But the whole time I try to say, okay, I'm going to give it five minutes. If he's still crying after five minutes, I'll go get him. So then I'm like getting ready for work, but I'm staring at the clock like, how long has it been? My son's crying. There is definitely that pull on the heartstrings. And so just when I'm about to go in and get him, it's quiet. And I look at the monitor and he's asleep. And I know I've done the right thing because he's exhausted and he needs his sleep. It's just, it's so hard. It's not that it's easy to listen to them cry. It's not. It's just like ultimately I feel like I'm doing what's right for him. But like I said, maybe we can devote a whole nother podcast about that because there's just too much to say. But this one's about mom guilt. So I want to share another thing that moms feel guilty about, their child's behavior. On the last podcast, I talked about how my daughter does tend to have difficulties from time to time at school slash daycare, whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, I mentioned that she had been getting into trouble a lot. I laugh because it really only got worse. We had a week a couple weeks ago where literally every single day when I picked her up, I was told that she hit someone. And on one day, on the Friday of that week, not only did she hit someone, she took off her shoe and hit someone in the face with her shoe. Am I raising a serial killer? I hope not. It's just so crazy because, you know, I really, you have to think about like whether or not you're going to spank your child because so many people have opinions on that. I was never spanked. Was I a good kid? I like to think so. So maybe that's why I wasn't spanked. But I don't feel like I could ever spank my child. I just don't. 
you know, I was never spanked. So that's just kind of not in me. I'm not like a physically aggressive person. But, you know, I, so my husband and I have kind of talked about it and we've decided we don't necessarily want to spank our children. Can we predict the future? No. But that's kind of something we want to try to accomplish, not to spank our kids. And one of the reasons is because I feel like, how can you tell your kids not to hit someone if you're going to hit them? Like, to me, that just seems kind of hypocritical. And how would you explain that? I don't know. And one of the reasons I've thought, like, I don't want to hit my kid is because I don't want to teach them that hitting's okay. Like, I'm going to make my kids hit people if I spank them. But here's my daughter who's never had a hand laid on her aggressively in any way, and she hits people. That's so hard to understand, hard to comprehend. So, I mean, those days where I picked her up and her teacher had to tell me that, I just felt like myself shrinking into the seat and being like, I'm sorry. Like, i feeling so guilty. Like, what have I done wrong? Like, what did I do to make my daughter like a child serial killer? I don't understand. And I remember one of the days texting my husband like, yep, she hit someone again. And his response was, um, you know, we're going to have to change some things. And I was like, huh, what kind of things can we change to make my daughter stop hitting people? And, you know, it's kind of hard for my husband to understand because I definitely spend more time with the kids and that's not a job in any way possible. My husband works harder than anyone else I know and he will do anything to provide for his family, side note. But, you know, I can't help but, again, feel guilty like it's my fault because I spend the majority of the time with the kids in regards to discipline. So it's kind of like, When he says we need to change some things, there's that guilt of I need to change some things. So it's like, okay, like what do I need to change? And so instead of texting back in response to that, I decided to call him. And I was like, you know, just out of curiosity, what do we need to change? You know, like when my daughter acts like a lunatic, she doesn't get rewarded. Like when she screams that she wants, let's say she's screaming that she wants, um, I don't know, to play outside, I don't say, sure, sweetheart, let's go play outside. No, I tell her, if you're going to act like that, then we don't get to play outside. Mind you, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Like, even though I've only been a parent for two and a half years, like, I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I just feel like I do the best I can. Hmm, maybe I don't do the best I can. Let's just say I try to, because obviously I could do better, but again, I don't have the energy to be the perfect mom. So it's just tough because I'm, he, his big thing is he doesn't want to raise a brat. I don't want to raise a brat either. So then you're kind of wondering, like, what's normal behavior for a two-and-a-half-year-old? Like, are they all brats? I feel like that's kind of what we're led to believe, like, oh, the terrible twos. But then from what I hear from other people, it really just doesn't get better. There's no, like, awesome eights or anything like that. I just, I feel like we just got to get through it. Like I told him, I really don't feel like there's anything that we can change. I feel like we kind of just have to ride through the storm and, you know, kind of get through it together. And so he, he kind of agreed on that because even though there's so many things I could probably do different, I don't know if it would necessarily be better or worse for her. I feel like I can kind of tolerate her, um, madness from time to time because I feel like I understand her. She's very sensitive like I am. I think one of the reasons my parents never had to spank me was because I no one could punish me as bad as I can punish me. The guilt that I experience when I do something wrong is harder than anything anyone could say to me. You know, I think that's how I have gotten so far in my life is because I am hard on myself. You know, I want to I wanna try to do things as good as I can. I just feel like there's not enough hours in the day. You know, one thing I want to do better is be more organized, but how do people have time? You know, like I like to joke that even though I'm a teacher, I feel like I need a personal assistant to just kind of keep my stuff together, but, you know, that's just not possible. So anyways, before I get on another tangent about being organized, I think that's pretty much 
enough about mother's guilt. We probably shouldn't dwell on it anymore and make ourselves obsessed about all the things in our life that make us feel guilty. Because you know what I realized when I was thinking about all these things that I feel guilty about? I think the thing I feel most guilty about is that I don't really feel guilty. I don't know if that makes sense. But I feel guilty that I don't feel guilty. Is that weird? I mean, what I mean is I should feel guilty about spending time away from my kids. I should feel guilty that I'm not making baby food from scratch. I should feel guilty that I'm letting my baby cry. But deep down inside these different things that I'm doing, I know I'm making the best decision for me and my family. Is it the perfect decision based on what society thinks? Maybe not. But honestly, I'm the only person who knows what my child needs. I'm the only person that knows what my marriage needs. So honestly, like I said earlier, I can just continue to try the best that I can. And that's really all I can do. Thank you so much for listening to episode two. If you want to give me some feedback, again, you can email me at motheroftheyearpodcast at gmail.com. Go ahead and subscribe to this podcast to receive future episodes. Please leave it a rating and give it five stars. Thank you so much for listening, ladies, and the struggle continues next week.